All right, so this is a speaker meeting, and tonight we have a special treat. We have two speakers. So our first speaker is Brooke from Phoenix. Hi, my problem is Brooke, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm not fearless right now. Um, can I see a show of hands for everyone who knows, like, the new CPR? Right? Okay. Because, like, seriously, like, you know, like, yes, you don't breathe, you just push to the tune of staying alive. I might need that. <laughs> um, so my truth is that, um, well, God willing, my God is willing. Um, if, my, if, my, if my brain is willing, tomorrow I get to celebrate 16 years of sobriety. Um, thanks. With my girlfriend, Anna and uh, my girlfriend Kathleen, who I had the privilege of meeting in a room not this packed. Like, there's a lot of you guys. <sighs> I, say, I gotta say that out loud because I'll just sit up here and shake like crazy and sweat. Um, so I met some really amazing women in this room and they're still a part of my life today. Um, for the new people, I hope that you hear the similarities. Like, we all get here different ways and different lows and different challenges and different problems. Um, but what I hope that you hear is, like, the similarities and, like, I was broken. I didn't know I was broken, but I was broken. Um, alcohol was the only tool I had in my toolbox, and I didn't know that. Um, I came in here off of a car wreck, so cliche. I crashed my brand new Jeep on the freeway, heading to pick up my kids from daycare on St. Patrick's Day. So my kids grew up in these rooms. I'm so glad to see kids in these rooms. Um, my youngest will be 20 in July. My oldest will be 22 in October. So um, they've never seen me drink, not that they can remember, um, which is a gift of this program. Uh, but yeah, I, I crashed my car. I lied. I checked myself out of the hospital the, that night. I had a broken ankle, didn't know it. Um, bruised, broken, physically. I hid the ticket in a cowboy hat box in my closet and um, lied to everybody. Thought I got away with it um, until my ex-husband faxed me a copy of the ticket with a emergency decree to take my kids away from me. So um, that's how I got here, right? I knew I needed to do something. Um, I called a guy that I had dated and he said, you need to go to AA. I made a phone call, a gentleman by the name of Paul picked up the phone, told me to go to a meeting in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I went. Um, I haven't drank since then. So that was, that was, so I got in my, my car accident in March. Um, my sobriety date is June. So I did a lot of detoxing between that time at home. Um, I couldn't drive. So um, my sister moved in with me to take care of my kids and bought me alcohol on occasion. Um, so, you know, I come from a line of enablers. And uh, she was pretty fed up with me. Uh, moved out, uh, as, but as soon as I could drive, I got into the rooms. Um, broken. My experience in these rooms is that you can't do it unless you're honest. And I have the privilege today of just being honest in all aspects of my life. Like, it's not always simple. It's not always easy. It's always simple. It's not always easy, right? I am flawed. I am human. Um, I'm really struck right now by, like, this program saved my life. These women saved my life. Um, doing these steps saved my life and saved relationships. Um, I didn't know how to have relationships with people. I'm super pleasant. 
I can smile at you. Um, most people like me unless you don't. Um, but uh, I can put on a really good show. And I did that for a long time because I didn't know what else to do. And then that bottle of, I'm a whiskey girl. Jack Daniels is a terrible driver. Um, but uh, that was where all the emotions, feelings, I'm not really good with feelings. I have a lot of them now. Still don't particularly like them, but I, you know, I process them and I work through them or I share them with people now. You know, love, joy, happiness, sadness, fear. Um, yeah, but that, so that bottle's gone. And once that bottle's gone, I had to figure out how to process new, new tools. I have a whole new toolbox, right? Um, that includes friends, family, um, people who work a program, some people who don't work a program. Um, and it took some time. You know, I, I came in, I stayed in. I learned pretty quickly, probably within my first 90 days, that if I drank again, I didn't have another opportunity. Um, that's for me. I know a lot of people who have drank again and come back, but I feel like I was that broken. Um, I didn't realize that I was, I wouldn't have ever called myself suicidal, but this program taught me that every time I got in my car after I had been drinking, you know, I had complete disregard for my life. More impactful for me was the complete disregard I was showing for everyone else's life who was driving basically anywhere in Phoenix after 10.30 at night. So um, that's a hard pill to swallow. I don't know if you heard me say I was on my way to pick up my kids when I got in that car accident. So them included, right? Like I was willing to jeopardize the life of my children because I wanted to drink. Um, they haven't seen me drink. So I got married in the rooms, got divorced in the rooms. <laughs> if you marry an alcoholic, there's, you know, a couple of you in the house. Um, but you know what, that, even that relationship, <laughs> they suggest that you don't get into a relationship in the first 12 months. I learned that the hard, the hard way. Like, it's a really good suggestion. It really is. Um, that's my perspective, right? We all got to do this our own way. I mean, be in the rooms. I came for like the next six months because there was a super cute guy, right? Whatever gets you here. Super cute gal, friends, desire to quit drinking, hopefully, right? And that's just it. it I had a desire. That was the, the underlying importance was that I didn't want to continue to do what I was doing. I didn't want to lose my kids. Um, I did. I lost them for a year. I spent 60 days in Tent City on a work release program. Um, saw my first heroine in Tent City. Uh, and, but I got to go through that experience sober. So I was into my eighth or ninth month of sobriety when I did that. And what a blessing that was. Because I saw men and women leave, get drunk, try to come back spend a weekend detoxing and it was just like drunk people keep me sober I don't know about you guys um, that behavior scares me and I they're joyless right and I there's a couple things that I found in this program that I didn't know peace was one of them I remember walking in and sitting down and reading the sign that says you will know peace and all I knew is that I did not know what that word meant. And let me tell you, I know what that word means. And it's probably one of my favorite parts of sobriety is that I'm super peaceful. I'm pretty calm, laid back, but now I know peace. And that's God given for me, power greater than myself. And it gets me through every day. And if I get unsettled or unpeaceful, I know it's because of me and nothing else. I don't, I don't 
blame other things now. I am accountable to myself, which was something I'd never been. Um, tried to be accountable to others. Uh, that was, that's pretty difficult. Uh, was pretty difficult for me. So doing these steps, getting engaged, um, AA saved my life. I've done a, I did a church program as well that I loved. Um, but this is where my heart is because this is where I got sober. This is why I get to hang out with these two beautiful ladies, um, be up here sweating, and, um, you know, just the gifts. Like, my daughters haven't ever seen me drink. I have a stepson who um, I told him where I was going. and He's like, you've never had a, I'm, I'm married to a normie, you've never had a drink? I said, no, I'd, I'd have, I've had a drink. I've had lots of them. <laughs> um, but not in the you know, last almost 16 years. And uh, he was just like, you know, he just kind of tilted his head. Like, his dad drinks on his occasion. His family drinks on his occasion. But I don't know that he ever processed that I didn't, right? He just knew I always drove, that everyone else was, you know, got home safe. Um, so that was a really cool experience that I get to have 16 years into this just yesterday. Um, I give my AA chip to my dad every year because um, I'm kind of a daddy's girl. And uh, he was the... My mom's pretty aggressive, and when she, <laughs> Kathleen knows my mom, um, when she was displeased, God, I used to have high drinks behind my TV, so my mom wouldn't see them. Oh, God. Like, I don't have to hide cocktails anymore. I don't have to worry about what my breast smells like, other than, like, I'm going to an AA meeting and ch chomping gum, because, you know, I don't want you to smell my breath from up here. Um, <laughs> My brain still doing recovery regularly. Uh, but yeah, my mom's pretty aggressive. So I, when she was displeased with my behavior, um, it was usually around my drinking. Um, and I was usually embarrassing her in some way, shape, or form. Uh, she was pretty vocal and volatile about it. My dad, however, was the silent, patient, kind, loving type. So he gets my chip. Um, it drives my mom crazy. That might be another reason. But <laughs> um, I'm grateful today to be sober. I can tell you that um, when I was newly sober, I'd drive by a patio and see people drinking and smoking um, and think, oh, God, that looks so cool. Like, right? They're having fun. And, and I was just kind of had to think, like, I can sit on a patio and drink a Diet Coke and smoke. Um, I've since then quit smoking. That sucked. When I started, when I, when I um, got into the rooms, I started drinking a Diet, Diet Rockstar. I drank three a day for a really, really long time. Um, that habit I changed just here recently. They changed the flavor. So now I don't have my Diet Rockstar I know, right? No more Diet Rockstar. Um, but it was kind of a bittersweet thing because it was. It was a, a symbolic of the beginning of my sobriety. And it, it was a crutch for a bit, right? It's something that I gave up something but introduced something else that didn't jeopardize anyone else's life and, um, you know, made me feel a little jittery and maybe a little good. Um, but I was able to let that go. <laughs> With this, with this program, right? One day at a time. Um, I crave it still sometimes today, and I wonder if I can have one. And, and they taste like shit, so I'm not, oh, oh stuff, sorry. Um, but, you know, my, my alcoholic thoughts show up still today. And um, I get to pray, I get to talk to people, I get to run steps. Um, one of my most f favorite things about this program is that when I'm wrong, I get to say I was wrong, and I get to ask you 
what I can do to make it better. Um, that's something I never would have done because you were probably not that important to me. Um, and now you guys are that important to me. Is that 20 minutes yet? <laughs> oh no, well, I'm done at 20. She's got to go. <laughs> we're good? Okay. <laughs> like seriously, I'm dying up here. You guys are fantastic. Thank you. Um, but uh, what I would like to say again to the newcomers is like, keep coming back. There's so many like sayings, like keep coming back. It works if you work it. If you want to drink, don't call somebody. Just call someone. If you want to drink after that, call someone else. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Oh. Can we help you out? Now I get to introduce to you my very good friend, Anna. Thanks, Brooke. I'm Anna. I'm an alcoholic. I'm really grateful to be here. And um, so my sobriety date is June 4th, 2005. And uh, I'm reminded, like, I, we haven't stayed in close touch for 16 years, but we've always stayed in touch. And these two women, I'm so reminded tonight as I was listening to Brooke, especially about our kids. Right. Mine were three and four when I got sober. They are 19 and 20 now. And our six kids, these two beautiful women, had sober moms, like cut pepperonis and cheese and snack trays and go play on the tennis courts while we would sit around and drink Diet Rock Stars. Um, and here we are today, like 16 years later, I know that I can call these women and they're gonna be there for me. And um, like, who would have thought that? I, I, my, my marriage lasted, I think, 10 years <laughs> before I got sober. Um, and these friendships 16 years later are, are priceless. So um, it, I had my first drink when I was six years old, my last drink when I was 36 years old. You know, there's a bunch of pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization in there. Um, but I, I, I want to talk about, like, June 3rd, 4th, and 5th, 2005. So June 3rd, 2005, uh, my then-husband and three- and four-year-old son, we are at dinner at... Um, I don't remember the name of the restaurants on Scottsdale and Thunderbird Road, and we order these big, tall, cold beers, and we're with another family, and the wife had previously told me that the husband was an alcoholic, so he had ordered a coffee, and here comes our frosty beers, and uh, he says, I go, oh, I'm so sorry, I, I hear, oh, and he looks at me, and he stands up, and we're in a booth, and he stands up, and he puts his hand out, and he says, I'm Jeff, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm like, it was so awkward, right? <laughs> so I shake his hand. I said, I, I'm Anna. And he said, are you an alcoholic? And I said, yeah. Because I had known I was an alcoholic at like 21, right? At 21, we're like, yeah, we're alcoholic. Drink. And um, so 15 years later, this man says, are you an alcoholic? And I said, yeah, I am. And he said, do you want to get sober? And I said, yes. Because three months prior to that, I had looked up an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and it was in some place in downtown Phoenix. And I'm sure it was somebody's backyard where I was going to get murdered, so I didn't go. <laughs> but God intervened, right? God intervened. And he put his hand out, and uh, he said, okay, do you? And I said, yeah, I want it. I, like, I was totally willing. And um, he said, well, enjoy those beers. They're going to be the last ones you ever have. And he said... Do you want me to take? Do you want to go to a meeting? Yeah, I want to go to a meeting. He was like, he did not believe me. Like I understand that now. Um, <laughs> he said, "Here's my phone number." I mean, we were friends, right? Our kids played together. Um, call me tomorrow, and I'll pick you up and take you to a meeting. I said, "Okay." He did not believe me. So that night, uh, you know, kept drinking those cold beers. I guess my husband drove home that night. Uh, went home. 
drank like a 12 pack of Coors Light to top off the night, got in a blackout fight with my husband, and the next morning, June 4th, 2005, called this guy, said, yeah, I, you know, are we going to meeting? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take you to a meeting. So he picked me up and took me to a speaker meeting at North Scottsdale Fellowship, and the guy was dressed in a suit, and there was, you know, 100 people, excuse me, 100 people in the room, and I didn't realize, I remembered it like years into sobriety that I did stand up in that meeting and say, I'm Anna, I'm an alcoholic, and I cried. And the only thing I remember about that speaker was he had this, like, I thought it was like 1950s suit, plaid suit on, and, uh, and he seemed really old. And, <laughs> and I was 36, right? Like, people who are 20 tell that story. And, um, and the only thing I remember about his his lead was that he would pass out in bed with cigarettes and his wife would put the cigarettes out for him. Like that was not my story, but that's when I remembered. <clears throat> so the next morning, so now we're on June 5th. Uh, I think he might've asked me that night or whatever. June 5th, he said, do you want to go to another meeting? I said, yeah, I'll go to, uh, I'll go to a meeting again. And he said, okay, I'll take you to this meeting tonight, but it's the last meeting I'm going to take you to. You have to find a woman. You have to get connected. You're on your own after this. Okay, fine. Because I thought it was going to be like, you know, those ladies meetings I went to when I was living in Washington, D.C., because, you know, I'm all that in a bag of chips, and we have ladies meetings once a month. And uh, he takes me to a meeting in Pinnacle Peak, and it's a 12 and 12 meeting. And they're and, – and <laughs> And he's kind of, they do chips at the meeting, right? And I literally thought that he had, like they were doing the 24 hour chip just for me. <laughs> yeah, it was just all about me. He had planned this all out. Anybody need a 24 hour chip? And he kind of looks at me like, is she gonna go for it? She's gonna like say yes? And I was like, of course, it's all about me. So I picked up a 24 hour chip at that meeting. And in that meeting, we read from the 12 and 12 and the fifth step, which the way I heard it, it's not verbatim, but what I heard was an alcoholic feels alone in a crowded room. And I looked around the room and people were shaking their heads and everybody understood what that meant. And I had never knew that anybody else felt that way. And I'd felt that way my whole entire life. And I've stayed and I have stayed. And, you know, in 16 years, I've done the steps multiple times different ways. I've had multiple sponsors. I've lived um, in multiple cities. <clears throat> I just spent the last eight years in Florida. Um, got back to Arizona almost exactly a year ago. And Brooke pointed out to me that every year that I've lived in Arizona, we've gotten our chips together every year. So we're going to do that again this weekend, right? Tomorrow, <clears throat> we're going to get up and go to a meeting, and she's going to pick up her 16-year chip. Um, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. So I, it's interesting how I believe this life has worked for me. I sometimes feel like Alcoholics Anonymous has been like this loophole for me. Like maybe I signed up ahead of time, like, hey, if my life's not working and I tear it all down, you know, with pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization, you know, drinking, ignoring my family, you know, is there something else I can try in this lifetime just in case? And Alcoholics Anonymous has given me that opportunity to live a whole new, different life, but it's also given me an opportunity to kind of live a lot of that over. Like, for example, my one year sober, um, I go to pick up a one year chip at a meeting I had never been to, my sponsor brought me to, and they asked me to be this speaker on the spot. <clears throat> There's this guy there, and um, I recognized him, but I couldn't remember how I recognized him. So before, it was the meeting where they did the introduction, and then everybody went out and smoked and came back before the speaker. So I'm like, hey, did, did we go to prom together? He's like, no, and he was not very nice. No. Did you go to the same high school as me? Did we go to homecoming together? No, he was, he was not nice. So I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. Do you know this story, Brooke? Oh. So we go out to smoke, and um, 
And I don't know, we start talking again because I'm like, I have to know, right? So I keep badgering this man. And, uh, and we, the more we talk, he says, oh, um, you know, Indian Reservation. Oh, NAU, NAU. Oh, NAU. I went to NAU. Oh, yeah. I worked at the Mad Eye. Oh, you worked at the Mad Eye? Oh. Oh, you're that, Anna. <laughs> I was like, um, do I owe you an amend? It's one year anniversary, right? Like, which is like, I'm a rock star. I made one year. And here's this guy like, oh, no, you don't owe me an amends. I mean, that was awful. It was wonderful and awful all at the same time, right? My past, I had to clean up my past. And my past has shown up in different opportunities to clean it all up. And I don't act like that anymore. I don't behave like that anymore. <laughs> Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Um, so... This week, June 3rd, Thursday, um, well, I just want to back up a little bit. Like, So it seems to be a pattern for me that about a month before my anniversary every year, things get weird. And they're not good. They're not bad. They're just weird. And it's like, what, what is going on? What is happening? Why is this happening? Because it's just bizarre stuff. Um, so I have had a month like that, including vertigo. I have vertigo that hit me a week ago. Like who knew that, you know, probably half the people in here have had vertigo. I never knew anybody before last week who had vertigo. Um, so that's a bizarre thing. And so Thursday, um, you know, I'm pretty excited. I, you know, Nan and I talked a couple of weeks ago to schedule this. So I've had this conversation in my head for the last two weeks, right? It's not, I'm not saying anything that I was thinking, by the way. Um, and I'm really um, excited and I'm trying to practice that, no, I have 15 years instead of, you know, in a month I'll have 16 years. Cause I, I raised my kids that, you know how little kids are like, I'm seven and a half. I raised my kids, like, you're seven, be seven, enjoy it, enjoy it. Up until, I mean, they're 19 and 20, and I still do that to them. I will call them before their birthday, and I'll say, one more day to be 18, you better live it up, because you're never going to be 18 again. So I try to practice, like, what I'm preaching out there and teaching my kids. So super excited, nervous on Thursday. So Friday morning comes along, and somebody had... Um, said they wanted to take me to breakfast for my anniversary. So Friday morning, there's some texts back and forth, and turns out that this person cancels on me. And I am, like, crushed, just crushed. I was really looking forward to it. You know, that person had stuff going on. Okay, you know, we're doing what we're doing. I've done that before in early sobriety. I canceled on people all the time. So I get to live on the other side of that. But really the gift of that pain on Friday morning, right? So yesterday was that I remembered my sweet 16 birthday. So, cause somebody had said, hey, happy sweet 16. And when I was 16 years old, like somebody, my mom and my mom had set up this surprise 16th birthday party for me. I was working at Burger King. I come home from work. You know, I'm wearing the polyester, smell like Burger King. And I'm somewhere on the way in the car ride, like, I realized that this, there's a surprise at the house. There's one person there. One person showed up for my sweet 16, right? So I get to, and this experience keeps happening for me, like, I get more and more memories. The longer I'm sober, the more I do the deal, the more I help other people. And uh, so my 16th year did not start out well. And I'm like, well, it didn't start well when I was actually 16 years old. And then my brain starts going crazy. But I know what to do in this program, right? I know how to let go of that pain from a you know, broken-hearted, immature, um, insecure, already drinking pretty heavily 16-year-old and to hit my knees and thank God for the life that I have today. So the rest of that day, yesterday, it was pretty bizarre, but I got to end my 16-year um, anniversary in service. 
and talk to some other women in early recovery and hopefully share my experience, strength, and hope, right? I'm not responsible for you. I'm responsible to you. And the best way I know to do that is to be vulnerable and to tell you who I am and, and that I'm, I'm broken and I hurt and I'm afraid and I'm scared, but I know what to do and how to get out of that today. And I don't like how that feels anymore. Early sobriety, I really, um, I really, I was super depressive alcoholic when I was drinking and that lasted for years in sobriety for me. So I had another new experience. So like bizarre, I mean, bizarro stuff. So in 16 years, um, I've wanted to drink twice and it scared the tar out of me. And I've seen people kill themselves in sobriety. So, you know, I've seen that enough and I've been around enough people that do the deal that I knew what to do. You know, I made phone calls, went to the doctor, got on meds, whatever I needed to do to stay on the planet and to stay sober. And that was always because of depression and suicide. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. This, you know, this horrible disease that tells me that I'm not good enough. Last week, Friday, so eight days ago, I had like a super great day. Um, I was working with somebody and like click, 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 light bulbs are going off for this person. And I was feeling pretty good. I was like, wow, I might actually be pretty good at this. Right? So my ego kicked in. I, you know, I don't know it at the time because being so depressive and thinking that I'm so useless, um, having a new thought that I actually am kind of great was brand new experience for me. Split second, faster than I can tell you, split second, the thought came into my mind like, wow, I'm awesome, I should have a drink. <laughs> what? Like 16 years, the two times I've wanted to drink until last Friday was for depression, and all of a sudden I'm like, what, what is, this is like a new version of sobriety and new version of my disease, right? The progression of the disease. Um, yeah, so I am an alcoholic and I'm so glad to be. I want to also qualify because my experience in early sobriety was that um, I, grew, I, I sat in the 7 a.m. meeting at North Scottsdale Fellowship for like a year and a half. My sponsor, my first sponsor had a lot, a lot of time and uh, she said, you sit in the front, you leave your phone in the car, and you be quiet and you listen. And I was, I was scared of her. She was fabulous, but I was scared of her. Um, and what I heard in those meetings was, whether it's what's being said, but what I heard was there's drug addicts and there's alcoholics. And if you're a drug addict, you go to different program. And if you're an alcoholic, you come to Alcoholics Anonymous. My experience in 16 years is that seems to have gotten softer um, at least in my experience. And I, so I never thought I was a drug addict. I thought I was an alcoholic until uh, I think I was eight years, nine years sober, 10 years sober, whatever. Uh, I'm in Florida. So I lived in Florida for eight years. I think I'd said that. And when you are 45 years old and you have heart palpitations and uh, they and you go to the emergency room like I'm having chest pain and heart palpitations they like rush you in and take really good care of you and they also give you a lore tab so it was prescribed and you know I was out the next day did all their tests and everything and it took me it took me a few years to actually look back and go I've been romanticizing that lore tab one lore tab in my life I romanticized that for years, that one experience, that obsession about the feeling of that one prescribed experience makes me call myself a drug addict as well, um, which was new for me um, in this experience, in this, in my sobriety. And it's helped me to kind of, it, it's helped me to soften. And, you know, there's a place for everybody. There is a place for everybody. I hope that you keep coming back. I hope that you find, you know, something or somebody in these rooms for you. Um, there was something else that I'm sure was really important to share with you. Damn it. Damn it. 
Oh, I know. I know exactly what I was trying to, what I wanted to say, and the reason I even brought up Thursday. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? June 3rd, June 4th, and June 5th. Looking at those three days in my life this year, um, it's there's little drips along the way. There's little hints along the way. Uh, I have to make my own decisions and, and come to them, usually through pain, and thankfully I'm not in pain, but I know that there's more. Uh, and I want everything that this program and this life has to offer. I switched my prayer many, many years ago and said, God, all I want to do is fulfill the purpose you have for my life. And my life changed. Um, so in, I don't know what month she was here, but we had a speaker in the Rarely, Rarely group months ago. And at that time, I was going to ask her to be my sponsor. And I chickened out, or for whatever reason, I didn't ask her. And I've kept my sponsor in Florida because um, I love this woman. She's this, you know, five foot two biker woman from New Jersey who scared the tar out of me. That's why I asked her in, in Florida. And she's a wonderful, wonderful lady. I love her very much. But it's time. It's time. And, you know, feeling, you know, 16 years, I blinked and, and I'm here. And, uh, and I want to keep progressing, and I want those feelings that I had in early AA, you know, that conscious contact and that everything. I remember, and it's hard to grasp onto in the last few years, of just that knowing everything is so purposeful. I know it here, and I see it sometimes, but I want to live that again. So I asked um, a woman to be my sponsor, she agreed, so I have a new sponsor. So I'm going to start a whole new journey. This woman is, um, you know, she seems amazing to me. I asked her to be my sponsor because I want what she has, which is, you know, like long-term, deep, meaningful sobriety. And that's what I'm looking for because this keeps the progression of this. I want the positive progression as well. Because I believe them when they tell me that my dizzy is out in the parking lot doing push-ups. And I have evidence of it because last week it told me to go drink. So I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Um, I have a woman that I write to in prison. I, I got connected with her through uh, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous about two years ago. She's in Las Vegas. She's going to be released later this year. She asked me earlier this year to send her, hey, she wants to get a meeting started. We've been doing the steps through the mail. That relationship has been amazing because it's all through letters. Like, what a great opportunity. I really encourage you to do that, especially if you have some time clean and sober that, uh, and you have any time in prison. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous is looking for those people, and I think that they have a big shortage on men doing that work. So I would encourage you to just get on the website at Alcoholics Anonymous if you're interested in anything like that. Um, I have uh, a gal that I sponsor here. I'm learning new ways to be a sponsor. I'm learning it's okay to be vulnerable and compassionate uh, instead of the hardcore sponsorship that I got was, you know, shut up, sit down, and pay attention. And then I had a woman this morning, um, in the morning meeting I went to, where I heard her say that she was suicidal. She didn't say those words, but because I have that experience and I know what that feels like and I know what that looks like, I can listen in and I hear that. So I said to her, you know, how are you doing? What's going on? Uh, I said, hey, why don't you just take my number and just call me every day until you get a sponsor, until you find a woman that, you know, you feel comfortable sponsoring you. She's already called me today. Like that, like this is like what, there's one other f amazing anniversary gift that I want to share with you. Oh, and then I'll be done. Um, so those two little boys, three and four years old, are now 19 and 20 years old. And <clears throat> five years ago, we were living in a warehouse in Florida. Um, I had hit some trauma, some PTSD trauma, which came out sideways. We ended up essentially homeless like I have all due respect for people who actually lived on the street we lived in a in a warehouse five years ago me and these two boys and uh and I made it a great experience journey and adventure for them and they don't look at it like I look at it you know I look at it with some shame they think it was great but those young men today are both in college and uh 
the 20, the 20 year old, you know, we were homeless five years ago and he is in the middle of, not the middle, he's on, he's in the Atlantic Ocean right now at this exact moment on a sailboat because he goes to school at the Merchant Marine Academy. If you know anything about service academies, it sits right there with the Naval Academy and West Point. And he is on a sailboat on the sailing team in a regatta, like, and they're in fourth place last time I looked. Like that, I know paying it forward is what this is all about. But for me, that little schmoogabooga who, like, and these two women remind me how far we've come. And that young man, like, I'm an empty, I'll, I'll just keep blabbering. So I think I said what I needed to say. I'm so glad y'all are here. I'm in a room of my fellows. And um, if I can do anything for anybody, please let me know. Because the more I can help you, the longer this will work for me. Thanks. Let's thank our speakers one more time. <laughs>